Ok Itami to to psa aki sum Hello, we have arrived happily into the duck moon when the waterfowl begin laying their eggs or you might call it the um, the Easter moon you might think about it like that because Hallmark didn't make up that egg hunt <laughs> and it's not some symbolic Egyptian thing about fertility either uh, the important thing that happens in this lunar cycle are the eggs and those eggs are the end of winter famine um, so expect to see some egg collecting in the next well in a couple of weeks or so any case it's been a few days since I've put out any videos a couple of weeks I think since I've made any personal kind of video updates and so I thought today I'd take the camera along with me on my adventures um, and share some of my thoughts and experiences from the past week or two along with whatever I get myself into today. Right now, I'm uh, I'm trying to find a residence here on the west side of Lethbridge uh, where they have a family of skunks um, pulled up under their shed and they want them trapped and, and out of there. So I'm gonna set up a couple of traps, see what I can get. And I think on the, after I leave here, I'll go get an update on the um, Great Horn Owl Nest. I'll go check in on the Great Horn Owls and see what's going on there. So yeah, come along with me. <laughs> Let's have a little, little visit today. So go about my affairs. Okay, so here's the situation. The skunks are living here, probably just under here into the shed the side of the house and so I've set up a, a trap right outside their front door and another one just over here just around the bend so with any luck um, should get one or two animals within the next 24 hours we'll see um, <laughs> it's kind of a classic situation for the skunks around here you know they find an area somewhere they can climb underneath um, either some concrete like somebody's stair steps leading up to their front door um, if they can get under any kind of part of the you know concrete foundation at all they'll use that or they'll look for a situation like this with a shed this kind of thing um, they're not really climbers like raccoons so they're not ending up in attics and chimneys and that kind of a thing and you know these are the kind of situations like she told me the lady that lived here told me that uh, one of the skunks got tore up by their dogs um, so she wants to avoid that happening and that's 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 all good um, so I'm gonna move them but the thing once you move them once you get them out of there hopefully they will uh, quickly hole up that access under the shed because if you leave stuff like that you know I, I tell people um if you don't want the skunks and raccoons like myself I see them as synanthropic species I know that they're adapting uh, to living with us in this current kind of with this kind of cultural com complex that we have and the architecture that we have uh, these animals, a lot of animals, are adapting to living with us in this situation. And for those people who don't want the animals, you know, living in immediate proximity, like on their property, <laughs> um, then you shouldn't, you know, make it inviting, right? So if there's any kind of sunken areas like that where, where a skunk can get in and den, it's going to use it. Uh, so you got to get rid of those. You got to fill those in. You can't leave any food around. You can't leave any water around. You know, if you got dogs, you can't be having dog food outside, or it's going to attract animals. Um, this is the thing, hey. It, it's like, it's like people. It's it's as if you'd go and buy a bird feeder and put a full bird feeder in your backyard and then complain when the sparrows and stuff show up. That's how I see it if you leave things out that are attractive to these animals 
and then get upset because they're there. <laughs> Any case, uh, traps are set, so let's go see the owls. All right, here we are at the University of Lethbridge campus where there's owls nested and I'm going to walk in just over here taking this kind of path that the uh, some of the workers involved in the destination project have been following through the trees here. This should take us up to the perch where we last saw the male owl and then we'll go in and check on the nest once we see if the male owl's at his usual spot. <laughs> um, it's pretty warm. It's not too, not too bad. Um, wearing a toque, but I don't necessarily have to, and I'm not wearing a jacket, just a sweater. I think it's about maybe three degrees below zero, <clears throat> which is fairly comfortable. It got up to two degrees above um, a few days ago. And I was out in my shorts and sandals again, <laughs> back in my uniform. Gave myself a little haircut this morning. I'll show you, you know, I buzzed my usual buzz, but but this time for the first time, I left a little bit of longer hair in the front. <laughs> and uh, you know what that's about? That's because this area is starting to thin a little bit, you know. I remember, uh, Bob. Well, I remember uh, Bruce Willis, I think, had a phase like this where he was buzzing most of his hair, but but keeping a tuft. <laughs> Howard the Duck tuft on the front. And it's um, kind of how I feel, but I thought it looked looked all right with the, with the little bit of extra hair. Pull a Donald Trump and grow that sucker really long and wrap it around my head. <laughs> uh, I'm in the area with the... Um, I'm in the area where the male was perching that last time we saw him, but I'm not seeing him. Saw a couple of magpies. There's a magpie right up there. Not seeing the male. All right, I'm gonna uh, be quiet for a minute and we'll go walk him in here. Nest is right up that way. Right up there. And it's nice, doesn't look like too many people have been visiting in here. So oh there's the male. Male's up in the tree over here. I'll get it around at a different angle and you can get a good look at him. There he is. Give me a second, I'll switch camera so you can see him nice. All right, here he is. Being the good papa. Standing guard. Making sure nothing gets past his wife in the nest. Magpies will eat those eggs if they can. Oh, there he's going. I'm making him too nervous. Making him too nervous. All right, I'll move. Maybe he won't be inclined to run away. Nope, he's off. I freaked him out. Just moved over a couple of trees. Magpies are kind of swarming him. Ugh. Wifey is going to be right up here, and I'll see if I can get that that one angle on her back here, where uh, sometimes you can get a view of her. When she's in that nest, it's pretty tough, because she'll be hunkered right down. Oh, but I see her. Yeah, she's in there. She's sitting up. I don't know if you can see her there, like I can.
she really blends in with the with the tree that her nest is in you see her there <laughs> her little ears and head I will pull back around this way and um, hook up the uh, I'll put the GoPro up high so maybe we can get a peek at her from a from a higher angle. Yeah, I don't know. I can't really see on the back of the GoPro when it's up like that. I don't know whether we could get the look in, in there that I wanted or not, but everything looks like it's going well. They're still incubating the, the eggs. Um, so yeah, that's all I really wanted to check. They shouldn't be hatched yet. We're just at the turn of the new moon, so I think they started sitting them about maybe a week, 10 days into the... Uh, into the eagle moon so they probably don't got too much longer maybe a week longer and they'll they'll be hatching good stuff yeah i won't be bothering them a lot but uh i'll just check back every now and then to look at the development we won't be able to see those owlets for at least another month or so before they stop start to popping their heads over the rim of the nest but there will come a time when they'll be big and they'll be all sitting in there uh, last year I believe they had four four baby owls and that's a lot of baby owls in a nest <laughs> it's more typical to have maybe two three four is a lot um, but they got a healthy environment for it you know the university here it's lots of food between the the birds and the mice and stuff like that so anyway that's the owls let's move on thought before I went home to update on Mandy and show you what else is going on over there that I'd stop by Spopikimi here and see what's happening river starting to thaw as I was walking up here, I saw there were magpies out on some of the thawed areas. It's probably insect activity going on. Probably the, uh, the isocapnia stoneflies are starting to emerge onto the ice. Out on the big river island, I was seeing some... This island out here, I saw some uh, goose squabbles. The, goose, the geese are all in couples, of course. It's really hard to believe that we're only two weeks away from the geese laying their eggs. But that's the reality. <laughs> um, yeah, usually by this start of this lunar cycle, uh, that set area in the river there, this kind of mushy, you know, sludgy ice, that's usually wide open and clear by this time. Um, so we're we're still we're still in quite a bit more cold than we are usually in typical years but i think they'll still lay their eggs in two weeks in fact <laughs> i'll bet on it i'll bet you know the full moon there's going to be eggs we'll go down here to the wetlands and see what's see what's happening yeah, I thought I'd come out, come over here quickly, see what's going on. Uh, maybe record a couple of notes about the previous week. And then we'll go to the house. We'll look in at Mandy. And I'll show you another project that I'm going to be rolling on for the summer. So really just a couple of personal things for this video. And then there's some other stuff going on with Belle that I'll probably conspire with her to make a second video on, a different video. And uh, yeah, so 
what's been going on? Mostly with me, it's been the, the work. Whoa. Puddles in the forest here, and I'm crashing through the ice. <laughs> um, mostly with me, it's been my, my work for Lethbridge College, my research work. And uh, their research ethics board did approve the proposal that I put in for a, a survey and a couple of subsequent focus groups. And so that survey is going to launch on Monday. It's going to run for a couple of weeks uh, for indigenous students to take. There's a little incentive that comes with it if they decide to take it. It's about a 20 minute survey, but it's going to tell us a lot about what's going on there. And then can delve just a little bit deeper perhaps with the uh, focus groups into, into some areas. Any case, um, yeah, most of what I've been doing has been has been revolving around that research. Um, I got an email the other day inviting me to an indigenous students night, something like this at the college where um, they're planning to honor me uh, for the research project that I'm doing. So of course I'll, <laughs> of course I'll be there and very proud of it. But yeah, mostly, mostly that's what's been going on with me as I've been just focusing on the research and then I've had several visits to grade schools around the city um, to do some ecology uh, ecosystem games with them, a game that I made up and then uh, I always bring Valentine the ball python with me um, for the second part of the class so they can just get an experience holding a snake you know and uh, and drop some of that fear response, hopefully. I've been working with mostly fourth and fifth grade classes, and I've got a bunch more scheduled to come. So yeah, between that and my research work, um, my days are mostly occupied, and then, of course, I've got the trapping of the small mammals going on. Won't be long before snake season's coming about. Um, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> In fact, within four weeks, the snakes could be waking up. Now, I'm not, as far as Mandy goes, I know you guys are, are interested in her. I'm going to show you what, what's going on with her. Well, I'll, I'll leave this stuff with for Mandy till then. But uh, I want to talk about her release date. Um, what else? What else? There was a second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I recently went on some travel. Um... Went up to Edmonton on Wednesday. I was flown up by Norquest College to do a presentation for them, a three-hour presentation, and it was a really good turnout. Um, they had somewhere between two and three hundred audience members there at any one time. They put me kind of in the middle of their one of their new buildings, and they have a they kind of have a I don't know what you call it when there's almost like an auditorium in the middle of the of the building where all the hustle and bustle of student activity is going on but it they they set it all up and um, I had a kind of a, a podium stage and it was cool um, did three hours and then they took me to lunch and then while I was at lunch I got the I got an email and it was from uh, Air Canada and they said that unfortunately because there was a blizzard going on down here in Lethbridge uh, my flight had been cancelled for that day um, one of my flights I always have to when you go from Lethbridge to Edmonton there's no straight flights yet uh, it's just not enough commuters yet but I imagine pretty soon there's gonna be because those flights are from Lethbridge uh, in that direction are full. So what we do is we bump at Calgary. We take a small plane from Lethbridge. Um, I don't know if it's a 24 seat or something like that. Take that small plane from Lethbridge to Calgary, get off at Calgary, and then we get on a, uh, a larger bus to shoot us over to Edmonton. Any case, I was still good to go from Edmonton to Calgary, but my Calgary to Lethbridge had been canceled. <laughs> so 
and there was nothing I could do. They said because it's a weather thing, they don't put you up in a hotel or anything like that. You just got to bite the bullet, and uh, that sucked because you know I was making you know a nice, nice little several hundred bucks for the talk that I was doing, but factored into that always is if I'm traveling I got to eat and and eating on the road is usually more expensive um, there's always all kinds of little incidental things when you're traveling of course accommodations now Norquest had put me up for accommodations while I was there but but in Calgary I had no accommodations so I had to pay for my own so I lost a little bit of the profit that I would have made off of the talk well that I did make off of the talk um, but I don't know it wasn't too bad I can I can consider that my uh, the tax <laughs> I guess um, on that profit because it went toward business right so I'll be able to deduct it anyway. Um, yeah, so I did that, and when I got to Calgary, I had this I had this hotel booked. I was fairly close to the airport, and I thought I could hike it. So I started hiking, snowing, and uh, soon realized that you can't really hike out of Calgary Airport, even into the kind of nearby um, circle of hotels and stuff. Uh, the little hotel district that they have there in the industrial area on the northeast side around the airport. Can't even hike out there. Um, and <laughs> they just don't have, you know, they don't have sidewalks and there's this like tunnel that you have to go through that it's illegal to walk in. So, uh, so I had to turn around and go back to the airport. And then I saw a, uh, a shuttle for one of the other hotels. And uh, I, <laughs> he had a couple of clients in his shuttle. He's just about to take off. And I, I knocked on the window and, and told him, uh, I have a room there. I want, I, I want to get in. And so, <laughs> so I jumped in on a shuttle to a neighboring hotel. And he, he dropped me off and I walked in the door like I was going to go check in. Just walked out another door and then hiked over to my hotel. <laughs> so I shuttled it out. And, you know, I think I'm... I think I'm being really uh, smooth and getting away with stuff, right? Um, real criminal. <laughs> Come to find out, my hotel had a shuttle too. I could have jumped in my, my hotel shuttle. I didn't need to go through all that. But uh, yeah, that's how I got over there. Ate some, ate in a little, like tiny little African restaurant. Yeah, I just found this tiny little, tiny little place. It was uh, uh, the only other offerings, you know, right near the hotel were like McDonald's, Wendy's, you know, and W. Gross. So had the African food that was uh, chicken and chicken and plantain. I think I got a little video of it too. <laughs> much rather have kind of a little shop like that make me a nice meal. They got me a chicken with plantain. I'm sure it's going to be very yummy for dinner. Yeah, totally happy with my, uh, with my dinner find on this experience. <laughs> yeah, and then the next day, um, my flight wasn't until, which was yesterday, my flight wasn't until late in the afternoon, so pretty much just kicked my heels up at the airport and took it easy, um, waited it out, and so today I've got kind of all, a, bu a bunch of energy, I don't want to sit anywhere, I don't want to look at a computer, <laughs> um, I just want to be active, I want to be doing things, but I need to go back to the house because Belle, Belle has been, uh, Belle's waiting for me, I know she is, she's decided to stay home for the weekend instead of going with her mom like she usually does because she has some expectations of me. She's been waiting for me to come home um, to help her with a 
project she's working on. And we'll get to that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let me shoot home and I'll show you what's going on with Mandy. Okay, so I'm back home now. And here is Mandy. I know everybody's interested in hearing an update about Mandy. As you can see right now, she's just coiled here, relaxing, just sleeping. If I hadn't disturbed her opening the door. <laughs> but uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, before I left for Edmonton, she was pretty active moving around the, the enclosure here. And then even last night and this morning, she had some really active periods. Um, she's been going in and out of her water a lot, and she's been hunting. She's hungry, so I have to get her another mouse. Um, pretty quick here, probably in the next day I've got to get her another mouse because I know she wants to eat. Um, but before she eats, <laughs> I'm cooking a little something for myself. Oh, I want to say something about the uh, release date for Mandy. Hey. What are you up to? Hi. Stinkerbell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mandy's release date. She's going to be released here uh, pretty soon. Mandy? Yeah, probably about maybe even six weeks out. We're just waiting for the others. The snakes are going to wake up in about a month. And then two, three weeks after that, they should be moving out. And once they're, once they're moving out, once I start getting snake calls, it shows me that they're on the move. Um, Here's the baby. Mandy's Here's going. The baby princess. Yeah, she got the princess. The baby girl. Me and Belle are going to make another video a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, but right now I'm cooking us lunch. And this is a big experiment. Yep. Um, earlier in the week, we had a family dinner and Mahoney made grits and cornbread. Um, and then not a lot of it was eaten. There was a lot of leftovers. So we've had them in the fridge and I've been eyeballing them and I've been thinking, I wonder if that can make like a corn chowder kind of a thing. So I've taken the grits, added some water, added some milk, added some cheese. What kind of cheese? I don't know. Some soft cheese that was in the fridge. And uh, <laughs> added some vegetables. And I'm cooking up some fish to add to, so it'd be like a fishy corn chowder. And um, I know Belle here was very concerned when she saw the ingredient, the corn ingredient, because the corn was in a shape she's not used to. Yes, it is. <laughs> so she's just going to have a fish uh, while Mahoney and I have I the fish and corn chowder. Okay. Yeah, she's a, she's a big fish eater. She's a big fish eater and a big berry eater. Yes, I am. Mostly raspberries. Yeah, raspberries. She's been eating some blackberries. Yes. If you've seen the, uh, if, like, if you've seen the container in the fridge with the raspberries, it's like only a little bit is left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she doesn't even know that in the freezer here, there's okonoki as well. What? Yeah, Saskatoon berries in the freezer. She didn't have told me. <laughs> the berry those, eater. Those are my favorite. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to have lunch, and then I'll show you one last project that I'm getting started. And by the way, my uncle is ticklish. Yes, I'm ticklish. Mostly I'll, on the belly. I'll show you one last project that I'm getting started, and then that'll be it for this update. Okay, so here is the other project that I wanted to introduce, the last thing I wanted to talk about today, and that is my crow room. <laughs> when we moved into this house in February 2015, I committed this bedroom, this upstairs bedroom, to the, to the rescue crows. Uh, it has a nice window, they can look out, they can see the other neighborhood crows and such. And I figured I could fix it all up and make it very uh, usable by the crows. In fact, I didn't think I'd have to do too much. I laid in, originally I just bought some pieces of laminate flooring. Um, or vinyl flooring, laid them in here, just, you know, not a professional job at all. And uh, set up this kiddie pool with a, with a bird bath station. And that 
dining set there had long been committed to the crows. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, these two crows that, I, that you see now, the one that's kind of, let's see if I can get it to move up top. There we go. The one, the bigger one that's up top by the wall now, that's Kira. And Kira's been with us probably six, seven years now. Uh, she's my oldest crow and she was an adult when we got her. And there, there's some videos on my, uh, on my YouTube channel about her. This other one by the window, the younger one, who's very spastic. Um, unfortunately, this guy was a rescue crow who we adopted. Um, we found a couple to adopt to. And they had him for a while. They had him for probably six months, something like that. And then they were going through some relational issues and asked if I could come pick up the croaks. It wasn't being taken care of properly. And when I got there, I realized how much it wasn't being taken care of. It was in a really bad situation um, of neglect. And it was just, it was, it was gross. I mean, this is bad in here. You look at the, the crow room and this is why I got to undertake the project that I'm going to undertake. I want to, I want to totally re-outfit this whole room to be a, a, a really nice, you know, space for the crows that they can use and they can get as destructive as they want without hurting too much of the house. <laughs> and it'll be easily clean because as you can see the wall back here under the window, that's really not easy to clean unless I take like a steam cleaner or something like that, you know. Um, just crows in general, something about the, about their, their droppings compared to the magpies, like the magpies, they must not have a lot of acid or anything like that in their, in their uh, poops. But the crows are different. Um, so their poops leave a lot of damage and their, and their uh, behavior is also very destructive. Like you can see the patches, uh, just boards that I've put on the wall to cover areas where they were you know, if they can get to something, they're going to break through it. I've, I've put boards up around the, the window. You can see here uh, where they could reach. They decided to start banging into the wall there, and they've made a hole. Um, so what I want to do is I want to collect a bunch of just scrap wood like this, just this half-inch stuff, or even if I can find quarter-inch stuff from some of the construction sites um, from their... their uh, their garbage bins and stuff and I'd like to put boards all over these walls and then maybe even put um, you know some vinyl stuff over the top of that uh, so that the vinyl is really easy to clean right um, so yeah I want to I want to totally redo this whole room give them lots of you know options for perches and stuff to play with and that kind of thing um, but I'm gonna wait to do that I mean I'm not gonna wait to get started but um, most of the work that I'm going to do first is going to be outside, and I'm going to show you why. I think it, these guys are just too nervous all the time for me to be in here with them, even Kira now, because I'm in here for so long, she's got her mouth open, she's all upset. Um, Kira was one who got hit by a car, and I was right on the scene, and she was, since I grabbed her up probably less than five minutes after she got hit, um, she put two and two together in her mind that I was the one that hit her, <laughs> I think. And so, you know, every young crow that we've got that would have been very tameable um, because we got them as fledglings who had got bumped by cars, I think Kira has trained them to be afraid of us and, the, the, you know, the kind of abused one who was not only ne neglected, but I think probably there was little kids around him and stuff and just making him really super nervous and... Uh, and he's, even though he's been back with us for probably about two years, he's never shaken that. Um, and I don't even have a name for him. I haven't even named that crow. I, I didn't expect to have him this long. I expected to adopt him out. But yeah, I think it, they're going to be way too nervous for me to do the work in here with them in here. So what I want to do is once the summer starts, I want to put them outside. But I, I want to build them a nice enclosure outside. And they can spend the time outside. Um, while I refurbish this whole room and make it a very cool crow room. Um, another part, another thing that I got to deal with in this room is that there's mice. I've been able to, to 
drastically reduce the, the mouse population in the house. Um, but the crow room is, is a place where there's still a lot of problems. And when I clean in here, I see evidence of mice moving all throughout here. Um, and in the closet here, they've got a nice big you know, mouse hole. I had the wood, this, this is some of that construction wood that I started to salvage. I even found some um, boxes of uh, laminate floor, you know, that might be useful. Um, but yeah, I've been salvaging some wood, stacking it in here, but uh, I did that quite a while ago and then I had it up kind of up more against this wall and the mice took advantage of that and they made this giant, look at how big this is, you know, this giant hole in the wall and they're living up in there and uh, in fact they go, you know, they go up in and uh, I'm going to show you, um, they've done some damage to the other side of the wall. Um, but they only come out at night, you know, and come out eating and stuff. So I got mouse traps set up. And by the way, like these, if you're gonna buy one of these live box mouse traps, buy the metal ones. Um, I've got a couple of the metal ones, but I bought one of these plastic ones, these Tomcats. And what happens is the mice get in there, and if you're not monitoring really closely, you know, if they're in there for a few hours overnight or whatever, um, they'll chew out of this. They'll chew out of the plastic. So I have to like put some steel wool and stuff like that in the mouse chewed holes so I can just keep using this trap for however many more mice it's good for. Um, not that many, but yeah, it's supposed to be a live trap. They give you a sticky pad, you know, but I, that, I think that's really uh, inhumane. Might as well not be live trapping if you just stick them to the floor. It's gross. I can't even imagine. I'd ra far rather be envenomated or or constricted by a python <laughs> rather than die stuck to a stuck to something you know Ugh. but anyway yeah I gotta I gotta really do something about the mice that are still the whatever the family is still in this wall and I'll show you um, what they've done and I'm gonna deal with that today on this other you know the same wall but the other side of the wall they chewed through right up here chewed a hole I'm gonna patch that today chewed a hole in my living room you know and I knew it was coming because I could I could hear them that's why I started getting into the closet and messing around but I bought the stuff here um, I bought some fill and you know a, ba a wall bandage and you know sand sand sponge and a <laughs> and uh, what do you what do you call this putty knife and stuff so that's getting filled probably today um, and then out here I'll show you the area like I like I have the big enclosure out here I got two in fact I got one in the one there and one here and uh, but I'm thinking of making it even bigger kind of complex there for the birds to hang out in with in summer and I can still use the wire and stuff from these other ones uh, the cage material I think to incorporate into it yeah I won't, I won't be wasteful and stuff but I don't like either one of those enclosures in themselves uh, especially not for leaving birds out there leaving the rescue crows out there for say two months as I work on that room. Um, not that it should take me that long, but it probably will. Um, if they're gonna be out there that long, I, I like them to have nice accommodations and ways that they can get out of the heat or, or uh, get out of the weather conditions, whatever they might be, and um, that they'll be safe from predators. So, got a bunch of stuff, bunch of stuff with that project to do, but that'll be a, um, a continuing story for a little bit. We can follow the <laughs> the transformation of the crow room into something really cool. Okay? I don't have all the things in mind yet, but I think as I get working on it and seeing what kind of salvage material and stuff I can bring in to use, um, I think I can turn that place into a really cool uh, crow room for them and something that'll be way more easy for me to maintain and clean. So. I guess that's about it.
<laughs> for this week. Kind of a long update, but it's been a while.